Okay, I'm going to cover how to set up your camera to achieve a swirling star trail effect. Full disclosure, a significant amount of work in post is required here, but the practical side is equally important. First, you need to pick a good location with minimal light pollution, though I appreciate that's not always possible. For these examples, I actually took them in the back garden at my partner's house, as we were really lucky to have a few nights of very clear skies here in the UK. The next important step is to locate the Polaris star. If you know your stars, you can do this by eye, but there are several apps available for both Android and iOS that give you a really useful interactive map. The one I'm using here is called Skyview for iOS. It has a free version that you can grab off the App Store. I'm using the search function here to narrow down the Polaris, which very clearly guides me towards the star. Having found it, I can hold my device, iPhone, iPad, Android phone, whatever you're using, next to the camera and get a rough idea of where to frame the shot. Firstly, we have to ensure our focus is sharp. Now, I'm lucky that this camera has live view and focus peaking, both of which enable me to focus once I'm all set up. Failing that, however, I'm shooting with a wide-angle lens, that's 12mm on micro four-thirds, which gives me an effective 24mm field of view. And I know that I can set my focus to infinity and the image will be sharp. Now, something I like to do before committing to what could be hours worth of shooting is ensure I've got the right composition. Now, to do this, I'll first increase the ISO to a high value, such as 12,800. Then, I'm going to open up the aperture as far as it will go. It's f2.8 in this case. And finally, I'll reduce the shutter speed down to 1.6 over 1. I'll take a single exposure. Let's just bring it back on screen and have a closer look. My goal here is to take a rough test shot to make sure I've got the Polaris more or less in the centre of the frame. It's also a good way of ensuring I've got my focus set correctly, as you can soon tell if the stars look soft. I'm happy with how things are framed, so now we need to set up our interval shooting. First, I'll drop the ISO down to 800, which should provide enough sensitivity based on the shutter speed we'll be using. I'm then going to lower the shutter speed all the way to 60 seconds. Before we commit to interval shooting, however, I'm going to open up the shooting mode menu and then set it to a two second timer. The idea here is to just get a single test shot with our proposed final settings and ensure it looks good. Okay, if we take a closer look, this is actually pretty good. ISO 800 is sensitive enough to pick up lots of star detail from a minute long exposure. We've also got a hot pixel, which is to be expected. There will be plenty of those. So far, so good. Let's set the interval shooting up. My camera has a built-in intervalometer, which is incredibly useful. If your camera has this feature, the manual should cover how to use it. Alternatively, you could invest in an external intervalometer or simply a remote shutter with locking functionality. In any case, I'm going to access the shooting menu. Buried in this sub-menu is interval shooting slash time-lapse, which I'll access and move the option to on. Now we have various options here. I need the shots to be bunched together as close as possible, so interval length will remain at one second. Number of frames, however, I'll change to 120. The camera also gives us an estimated end time, which is great if you want to nip off and grab a hot drink. With that all set then, I'll enable the interval shooting option. Then I just need to press the shutter button in and it will begin shooting. And now it's a waiting game. As I was shooting this in the relative comfort of a back garden, I was free to go inside and keep warm. That sounds great, but I fell prey to a very amateur mistake. I didn't think it was that cold, but about an hour into the interval shooting, the lens began to mist up. This is a really common issue when the lens becomes colder than the ambient temperature around it and dew begins to form on the lens element. You can gradually see throughout the shots that it slowly gets worse and worse. So I'm going to cover a really cheap way of dealing with this in the next example, but I was able to salvage an acceptable result by using about 65 of the 120 shots I took. 
Moving on then, let's try another setup and figure out this problem of dew forming on the lens. A cheap and popular technique is to use disposable hand warmers. Small packets that, once activated, give out a small amount of heat. They're designed to be held in the hand, but you can also attach them to your lens using rubber bands. This method is a bit primitive and not very efficient, but you can also purchase wraparound mounts that actually hold the hand warmers in place and make the heat transfer a bit more efficient. With the heat warmers in place, I'll set up the same way as I did the last shot, checking focus to ensure it's sharp, then reducing the shutter speed down to 2 over 1, opening the aperture up fully wide to f2.8, and pushing the ISO up all the way to, let's try 16,000 this time. OK, so a test shot reveals the Polaris is more or less dead centre, and we've got other stars appearing bright and detailed, so that's good. Now, I'll bring the ISO back down, this time to 200, to try and achieve a cleaner result, as I've realised through test shooting that I don't have to raise the ISO so high. Next, I'll reduce the shutter speed all the way to 60 seconds, so we'll be getting one minute exposures. Finally, I'll access the camera menu and move across to the shooting mode settings and dive into the interval shooting options. For number of frames, I'll increase the value to 120 again and leave the start waiting time and interval length at one second each. Coming out of the menu then, I'll be sure to set interval shooting to on, then I'll move out of the menu system and back to my live view. And with that, I just press the shutter in and it begins the interval shooting. As before, it's a case of waiting for the shots to be taken, but here's the result of stacking those images and performing some further edits. The hand warmers have clearly done the trick, as we have a much clearer result. I did realise, however, that I don't need anywhere near 120 shots if they're all a minute long. Let's do one more example then, this time with the Polaris off centre frame for a different composition. As before, I'll fine-tune the focus to ensure the star is sharp, then I'll drop the shutter speed down to 2 over 1. The aperture is already at f2.8, so all I have to do is raise the ISO. Let's go to 20,000 this time, then we'll take a test shot. The Polaris can be seen very clearly, as it's markedly brighter than the other stars. So, now we're all composed. I can drop the ISO back down to 200, then reduce the shutter speed to 60 seconds. As I did before, I'll go into the shooting mode menu, enable interval shooting, and once again I'll leave start waiting time and interval length at one second. For number of frames, I'll settle on 80 this time. As I mentioned before, 120 one minute long exposures is a little overkill. If they were 30 second exposures, it might make more sense, but as it stands, even 60 exposures that are a minute long each will produce a really great result. 80 seems like a safe bet. Once again, it's now just a case of waiting for the interval shooting to finish. As far as editing goes then, what I usually do is pre-process the RAW files into 16-bit TIFFs. You really want to be working with at least 16-bit precision for this kind of imagery, and it's not unheard of to use 32-bit float, which offers more flexibility but results in even bigger file sizes, increased memory requirements, and requires more processing power to boot. I then stack the images, which Affinity Photo can do with relative ease, and once they're all grouped together, I set the stacking operator to maximum to expose the brightest pixels. This is essentially the same as importing all the images into one document as separate layers, then setting all their blend modes to lighten, so you can also do that if you're editing in other software. I do some cleanup work, including taking the Polaris star from just one image and ensuring it looks dead centre. Another thing I'll sometimes do is use an unsharp mask live filter with a large kernel value which increases local contrast. And this is great for making the stars really pop. 
But that's about it for this video. I do go into more detail with the editing in the accompanying article. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to check out the other videos.